So tonight, go out and look at the moon through a telescope, and you'll see many craters. No one still knows how they appeared there. Some of them have formed recently. Scientists have discovered a double crater on the moon that appeared for a strange reason. In March, a rocket crashed into the moon, and no one knows who owned it and why it left such a trail. If a regular rocket had fallen there, it would have left one hole. A standard space rocket has a heavy engine on one side and a lighter fuel tank on the other. But this time, there had to be two heavy sides on one rocket to leave a double crater. That's strange. No one knows what it is, and no one has claimed to be the owner. It was probably part of a large 3-ton rocket. This piece had been flying in space for several years. At first, astronomers thought it belonged to SpaceX, but the company denied this claim. Also, they thought that China had launched the rocket. But this was also wrong. In the near future, NASA experts hope to find out the truth. The problem with tracking such rockets and space debris is that this is quite expensive. Companies don't want to spend too much money on it. But soon, this will change. People will have to spend billions of dollars to monitor garbage or destroy it, since it's getting too crowded in space. Space companies will have to solve this problem, as it poses a serious danger to satellites and spacecraft. Just take a look. There are millions of pieces of satellites and rockets flying in space. Some of them are the size of a basketball, others are as tiny as a raindrop. The total weight of all this debris is about 9,000 tons. This is almost 2,000 tons heavier than the Eiffel Tower. Okay, all this garbage is floating there, so what? The problem is that it's not just floating, it's moving at a speed of 17,500 miles per hour. A tennis ball will fall apart into several pieces at such a speed on the surface of our planet because of air resistance. But there's no air in space. Nothing prevents a tiny piece of metal from reaching a speed 20 times faster than the speed of sound. A piece of paint at this speed can easily damage the casing of a spaceship. Once, several shuttle portholes were replaced because of the damage caused by flying chunks of paint. Now imagine what a piece of metal the size of a basketball can do to a spaceship. It could bring down the International Space Station. Many satellites were destroyed by space debris that crashed into them. And when those satellites exploded, they burst into thousands of small parts, which also turned into dangerous flying objects. For example, in 1996, a fragment of a rocket damaged 10 years earlier crashed into a French satellite. In 2009, a failed spacecraft destroyed another commercial ship. As a result of the collision, about 2,300 tracked fragments appeared, as well as lots of tiny untracked ones. Today, satellite operators receive warnings about potential collisions with space debris. But these messages are often either inaccurate or reach the operators too late. Imagine that a screw is flying at great speed toward your satellite. You'll hardly have time to dodge it. Perhaps it won't hit your satellite at all. This uncertainty makes these warning sensors useless. The problem becomes much more serious when it concerns the ISS crew members. A durable spacesuit can't guarantee protection from flying debris. And the station itself is too large to save itself from big objects by dodging. To keep astronauts safe, scientists have a catalog of things that are the size of softballs or bigger. They monitor thousands of fragments and analyze their trajectories, material, and dimensions. Next, they use the pizza box method to dodge garbage. This is the unofficial name for an imaginary square that is used to calculate the risks of a collision with space debris. So imagine a giant pizza box. It is 2.5 miles deep, 30 miles wide, and 30 miles long. Now put the entire International Space Station in this box. Yeah, okay, you can have it with pepperoni. Anyway, if some space object is heading toward the edge of the box, the crew will begin to develop a plan of action. The box's radius is quite large compared to the station, since it's difficult to calculate the debris's trajectory. If there's a chance that something might approach the box, then it can also damage the station. When operators receive a signal about approaching debris, they analyze it. Depending on the data received, the crew begins to act in a certain way. If it's something small and heading for some part of the ISS, the astronaut should evacuate from this part. And after that, they'll do repairs there. If something big is approaching, 
the entire station can perform an evasive maneuver with the help of the engines or a docked spacecraft. One such trick required about five hours of hard work. The station is a big clumsy ship, so it's important to know about the threat in advance. From 1999 to 2020, the ISS made 29 maneuvers to avoid collisions. Three of them occurred in 2020. And there will be more since the amount of garbage increases. If some object is too big and fast and can damage critical components, and it's impossible to dodge, the entire crew will have to evacuate. In the future, NASA and other space agencies will have to think about how to destroy this debris or remove it from orbit. One option is catching everything with extensive space nets. One agency suggested developing a solar sail that clings to debris and propels it to a low orbit. Another wanted to use an electrodynamic cable to slow down the speed of space debris with the current. This maneuver will cause space garbage to move toward the surface of Earth and burn up in the atmosphere. But what if one of these pieces still reaches the ground? Even now, many satellite parts fall on Earth. Fortunately, this is not so dangerous. The probability of cosmic garbage falling on your house is minimal. In addition, 70% of our planet is covered with water. Of the remaining 30%, only 3 to 10% are occupied by people. Almost all space debris falls into the ocean or unpopulated parts of dry land. But let's say some part of a satellite damages your property. In that case, the company that owns this space object will cover the losses. Such cases are rare and occur because of accidents in orbit. But sometimes, companies intentionally abandon their satellites. If a spacecraft is out of order, they turn it off and use the remaining fuel to slow it out of orbit and drop it in a safe place. Almost all such objects fall in the region of the spacecraft cemetery. It's located at the most remote point on Earth, Point Nemo. It's in the southern Pacific Ocean, east of New Zealand. The nearest island is more than a thousand miles away. The distance to the International Space Station is much smaller. It's challenging to get to this place since no ships travel there. That's why most satellites end up in that area. It looks like an endless sea. The ocean there absorbs explosive waves of any power without consequences. Even if some fallen ship or rocket causes a giant wave, it dissipates long before it reaches dry land. Fish and other marine creatures are also not at risk. Point Nemo is one of the least inhabited areas on Earth. Underwater currents carry nutrients through the ocean, and tiny living creatures such as photoplankton and other organisms feed on them. But these currents don't reach Point Nemo. Another way to deliver nutrients in the ocean is wind. But there's almost no wind at Point Nemo. This place doesn't have enough food to let large life forms develop. Just imagine how lonely and silent it is there. Sometimes, a broken rocket breaks the silence, crashing into the water at great speed and descending to the seabed, where thousands of other satellites are waiting to welcome it. The coldest part of our planet, Antarctica, keeps surprising us. Take a look at this waterfall named Blood Falls. Reddish water falls from the white ice. Scientists concluded that the color is related to iron. The water coming from the glacier oxidizes and rusts when it's exposed to oxygen, and the red color occurs. Step on Mount Gandic. It lays eggs. Well, maybe not real eggs, but the stones certainly look like dinosaur eggs. That's why the mountain got its fame. The, let's call them stone eggs, formed in one part of the mountain over 500 million years ago. Interestingly, this phenomenon repeats once every 30 years. Eggs come out in various sizes and shades. The stones appear on the surface of the cliff. A study made in the area has revealed that the composition of the stones of the cliff isn't similar to other parts of the mountain. Here, calcareous rocks rule. They're more prone to erosion. They ripen off day by day. It took three decades for the stones to get to the egg shape. Yet, it's still a mystery how these rock formations can be so perfectly spherical and smooth. According to scientists, every stone egg has an organic core. They're made of shells, plant remains, fish teeth, and skeletons. Maybe this has something to do with it. Gulu Village is close to the stone eggs. Locals believe that these eggs are sacred. Villagers associate it with good fortune. In fact, nearly every family has one of these eggs in their house. 
Unfortunately, there are only about 70 eggs left, so if you want to see them, you gotta hurry up. The Rich Het structure is a circular geological phenomenon in the Sahara Desert near Mauritania. It's made out of rocks in layers, and these layers look very much like rings. No wonder the unique structure even got NASA's attention. Up from the sky, the geological feature seems to be swirling and spinning. Scientists are still not sure how these rings got there. Some say it was an asteroid impact. Many others believe that it was a natural geological process. To them, the Rich Hat structure is an uplifted and eroded dome. Geologists often classify it as a domed anticline. The scientists discovered that the rocks at the center are older than the ring-shaped outer rocks. So it seems like the stones have been eroded to flat rock layers. Anyway, there's no valid explanation for this phenomenon, and the 28-mile-long mystery of the Sahara is still to be solved. Number 4 is Rapa Nui, or Isla de Pasqua, but I bet you know it as Easter Island. Yeah, it's got three names. It was discovered by Jacob Rogovine, who actually never intended to look for that island. He just casually landed there one Sunday. That's where the name comes from. Jacob was supposed to find Terra Australis. Disclaimer, it's not Australia. This one never existed and was nothing but a hypothetical continent. Plus, he wanted to peek at Davis Land, which was believed to have once been seen by Edward Davis, the pirate, not Edward Davis the saxophone player. Jacob failed at that too, though nobody ever saw that island except for the pirate Davis. Jacob may have failed to discover some lands he wanted to, but he discovered Easter Island instead. This is an island and special territory of Chile, located in the southeastern Pacific Ocean. It's on my list because nearly 1,000 stone statues called Moai were found there. They were created by the Rapa Nui people. Nearly all statues represent gigantic heads, but there are also a small number of figures kneeling with their hands over their stomachs. Each statue represented chiefs or other important members of Easter Island society. To curve those statues, the locals used volcanic stones that were softened. Our next stop is the gateway to the underworld. Nah, don't worry. This is just how people labeled Darvaza gas crater in Turkmenistan. This giant natural gas crater has been there for five decades. This crater is continuously burning gases. The president of the country wants experts to find a way to extinguish this continuous firing pit. This site was created by people accidentally in 1971 while working on a natural gas project. Ever since then, the flames have been on and it's become a tourist attraction. Mysterious constructions are sometimes built in our era, too. We don't have to go millions of years ago to long-gone civilizations. Edward Leedskollen single-handedly built a structure called Coral Castle in Homestead, Florida. He didn't use any large machinery. He carved and sculpted more than 1,100 tons of coral rock in 28 years until 1951. It's a mystery how he managed to do it all by himself. Leedskollen sculpted the sedimentary rock into different objects, such as walls, tables, chairs, a fountain, and a sundial. There's, of course, a legend behind this mystery, too. He was inspired to build the structure after being abandoned by his fiancée on their wedding day. Uh Uh-oh, runaway bride! Well, he wanted to prove his love to her and the world, so he wanted to do something extraordinary. Well, he definitely nailed it! Now, let's talk a little bit about the mystery of the Namibian fairy circles. There are millions of circular patches in hundreds of miles, ranging from 10 to 65 feet in diameter. They're called fairy circles because they look like a fairy or an otherworldly creature made them. These are essentially oval-shaped soil surrounded by grass. There are a lot of local beliefs surrounding the creator of these marks. Yet science says something else. Biologists and mathematicians have been puzzled by the mystery of the Namibian fairy circles for decades. There is more than one theory to explain this phenomenon. Here's one popular theory. The water is limited in the desert, so plants compete to reach the water. Some plants expand and thrive into a patch, but smaller plants nearby cannot get the necessary water to live. In the end, some vegetation disappears, and the remaining ones stay at the patch's edges. That's why they form such regular distant gaps. 
What if I tell you that there is a hill in Lay wow. City, India, where instead of rolling downwards, things roll uphill? It's an optical illusion. The road looks like it's a sloping hill because of its surrounding landscapes, yet the road actually goes down. These kinds of hills are called magnetic hills or gravity hills. Scientific explanations vary. The most common theory says that the hill has such a strong magnetic force that it can pull cars in the vicinity. Now, how about seeing some flaming rocks? Yanartash spread over an area of over 3 square miles. The place is located on a rocky mountain in southwest Turkey near the town of Chiaralea. Yanartash got its name from its appearance. It literally means flaming stone. The rocks have been flaming for at least 2,500 years, and they'll probably keep burning for the coming decades. The mountain where the rocks are is an inactive volcano, so it's full of tiny fumaroles that release gases such as methane. The gas ignites when it comes into contact with oxygen and creates the flaming effect. Uh, and by the way, back in the day, sailors used the flames as a natural lighthouse, as it's really close to the sea. Today, it's more of a tourist attraction, though. Hikers love it, too. Now, walk on this frozen Lake Abraham in Canada. In winter, the frozen water gets filled with ice bubbles. It looks magical, but these white orbs aren't that safe. They consist of flammable methane gas. Ew. Beauty can be misleading. The next one is from Racetrack Death Valley, USA. There is a dry lake bed with moving rocks. Now these odd rocks look as if they've been pushed or dragged by someone or something. They leave both a trail and a mystery behind. The force behind all this is now understood. Surprise! It's the wind and some ice. Scientists say the wind pushes the rocks during brief windows when the soil is covered with ice. Now, I can't help you hear the word Paris and a picture of the Eiffel Tower comes straight into your mind. Or croissants. Or maybe you imagine going on a romantic stroll in the city of love. Or croissants. But not many know that right below the bustling city of Paris, there is a series of underground passages, the catacombs. They're home to the remains of more than 6 million people. Whoa. But it wasn't always like that. Paris used to be a vast swamp. It was because most of the city was submerged in water at one time. Due to this, once the areas rose to the surface, the ground became rich in minerals, the most important being limestone. To extract it and use it to develop Paris, underground mines were dug up somewhere around the 14th century. They were dug horizontally to prevent collapse and to deal with the weight of the ceiling. Most of these mines were set up on the right side of the River Seine. Soon, Paris started expanding beyond its old city walls. Here's where it got tricky. The city started building on top of the land where they had dug all those tunnels. This caused some big problems, like the ground collapsing. In 1774, one of the roads in the suburbs collapsed about 100 feet into the ground. Due to rising safety concerns, officials decided to abandon the mines. The quarries were checked, and the tunnels were renovated to avoid future disasters. The bones ended up in the tunnels because of another major problem Paris faced a few years later. The growing population of the city caused an increase in the number of bodies. Cemeteries became overcrowded. And the city was actually so bad that, at one point, bodies could not be taken care of properly. They started to rot and spread harmful bacteria. So those who were in charge of Paris got an idea. They picked a new spot that was like a secret hideout for bones one of the old mines. The process of moving the bones from cemeteries to the tunnel started in the late 1780s. They began with the biggest cemetery in Paris, the San Innocent Cemetery. They didn't want to scare people, so they moved the bones at night. The remains went into two big holes in the ground and then got stacked in the tunnels by the quarry workers. They continued moving the bones until Paris developed into a city in the 1860s. The official name given to the collection of mines turned cemetery was the Paris Municipal Ossuary. But this name never became popular, and the tunnels instead became known as the catacombs. While the bones were still being added to the collection, the officials saw fit to open the place for public viewing in the year 1809. Tourists had to make a prior appointment and sign a guest book. As time passed, 
famous people started visiting, including the future King Charles X, Austrian Emperor Francis I, and Napoleon III. Of course, the rules for visiting have been changing over time. But now the catacombs, also known as the ossuary of Denferrochenro, have become a famous tourist spot. Around 5 million people come to explore it every year. What drives them? Well, in addition to the creepy but rich history, the catacombs are also considered one of the most haunted places on Earth, and there are several unsolved mysteries surrounding them. Some years back, a camcorder was discovered in the catacombs with a bit of footage. ABC Family showed the video in their documentary. In the clip, you can see a man very deep inside the catacombs, exploring alone. The video is from his point of view, and he sees something strange. He runs away terrified and eventually drops his camera. What happened to this man is still unknown. He was never found or identified. There are also reports of people getting lost in the catacombs, the most famous being a doorkeeper who got lost in 1793. His body was found 11 years later near an exit. How he passed away remains a mystery. There are also some not-so-eerie but equally strange mysteries surrounding the catacombs. There are people who like exploring the tunnels on their own. They're known as cataphiles. These people go into the quarries that have been abandoned to the public and long forgotten. Some explorers discovered secret water pools in the abandoned areas, and people would go to take a dip there. In 2004, police patrolling an unexplored area came across a 5,300-square-foot cavern with a movie theater. There was a screen, projection equipment, some classic movies, and even chairs. There was also a restaurant-like setting nearby, three telephone lines, and, well, electricity, which hinted that a group of people had been living there or regularly visiting. But when the police came back three days later with experts to find the source of the electricity, they found that the wire had been cut off. Only a note was left behind. Do not try to find us. Such enthusiasts existed in the past, too. Once, a Parisian farmer did the same and came across button mushrooms growing in the catacombs. He saw an opportunity to make easy money, and he actually created mushroom farms in the tunnels. He even got official permission for it. By 1950, a hundred farmers had been working inside growing mushrooms. There's also a scary legend about the catacombs that some people believe in. According to it, at midnight, unexplainable voices can be heard in the catacombs. They try to convince people to go further inside the catacombs until they can't find their way out. There's no strong evidence whether this story is true or not, but thinking about it is still scary. Due to safety issues, today only a small part of the catacombs can be legally toured by the public, less than 2 miles, while the catacombs go on for 200 miles. And still, the tour is an hour long, and it perfectly captures what's worth seeing. Solo traveling is extremely dangerous, as there is the possibility of getting lost. Mm, no thanks. In 2017, two teenagers entered the system through a secret passage. They were found three days later and had to be treated for hypothermia. The tunnels, damp and old, have an average temperature of 59 degrees Fahrenheit. Keep in mind that the entrance alone is uncomfortable enough to turn some people away. To get inside, you have to go down a winding staircase that takes you a little more than 65 feet below the surface. In the beginning, you find yourself in a well-lit room filled with interesting information and displays. But as you move forward, the place gets eerily silent. You pass through a creepy entrance that boldly declares this in French, which when translated English is something like, stop, this is the empire of doom. It's not exactly a warm welcome, and that's because the Paris catacombs are known for their haunted reputation. As you move deeper, the sounds of the world above fade away, and soon you are surrounded by the silence of the earth below. The bones themselves are placed strategically, almost in artistic patterns. This was the idea of a man who was once in charge of the place. He turned the bones into a kind of underground museum with cool structures like columns, plaques, altars, and even some weirdly shaped forms that some people consider art. Popular all year round, the catacombs become particularly loaded around Halloween. People organize special parties or events near the place too. 
But the most bizarre thing was offered by the catacombs themselves through Airbnb. The famous rental service allowed two guests to sleep in the catacombs. They were offered a bed for Halloween night and breakfast. Upon checking in, they were told tales in the history of the catacombs. This way, they went to bed fully aware of the fact that they were sleeping among the remains of 6 million people. Yes, it remains to be seen. The theory of parallel worlds has been discussed in the scientific community for a very long time. Unfortunately, we're not developed enough yet to prove or disprove it. But it's still an interesting theory, and that's why we have a lot of unusual urban legends about the guests from a parallel reality, according to many. Let's check out a few of them. A man from a non-existent country. This story took place in 1851 in a small German village, Frankfurt an der Oder. A lost man came out to the local villagers asking for help. The man introduced himself as Jopar Voren. He spoke very poor German and had a very strong accent. The man himself claimed that he speaks Laxar and Abram, languages that don't actually exist on our earth. He claimed to be from Laxaria, a country on the mainland called Sacria, separated from Europe by a huge ocean. However, none of these places existed on the Earth's map. People sent Yopar to the local authorities. He talked to a psychiatrist, but the doctor concluded that the man was totally sane. An investigation by the local police also revealed nothing suspicious about him. Yopar Voren claimed that the purpose of his visit to Europe was to find his long-lost brother. He survived a shipwreck and found himself near the village. They showed him a map of the world and a globe and asked him to indicate the place where he crashed, but he didn't recognize anything familiar. He seemed to have extensive knowledge about his homeworld. Yopar named five main continents on it, Sakria, Aflar, Ostar, Auslar, and Uplar. His story was considered plausible. Scientists from Frankfurt decided to send the man to Berlin for further research. However, during the trip, he had something like a seizure. The man suddenly jumped out of the carriage and disappeared into the surrounding forest. Despite a long and thorough search, no traces of Jopar were found. He seemed to have disappeared as mysteriously as he had appeared. Inspector Leboeuf, who was assigned to escort him to Berlin, thought this man could be a being from another world and that he had returned from where he had come from. Lady on Highway 167 This incident happened on October 20th, 1969. It was first reported in 1988 in the magazine Strange. The article tells about two men, L.C. and his business partner, Charlie. The names are fictitious. One afternoon, L.C. and Charlie were driving along Highway 167 in southwest Louisiana. Discussing work, they drove toward the oil center of Lafayette. The highway was empty at first, but then the men noticed a very old and very slow car ahead. The men started discussing this mysterious car. Such cars hadn't been produced for several decades, but this one looked quite new. The men thought it was thanks to the owner's care and admired it. They slowed down to get a better look at the car. L.C. noticed a bright orange sign on it that said 1940. They saw a driver. It was a young woman in old-fashioned clothes, a hat with a long feather and a fur coat, even though it was warm outside. There was a child next to her, also dressed in a warm coat and a hat. L.C. and Charlie wanted to talk to her, but then they noticed the expression on her face. The woman was looking around in panic, almost on the verge of crying. L.C. called out to her and asked if she needed help. She nodded, and he gestured for her to park on the side of the road. But when the men also parked, they suddenly noticed that the woman's car had disappeared. They looked around the highway in shock. She couldn't have gone somewhere far so fast, but the car was nowhere to be found. After some time, another man drove up to L.C. and Charlie. He saw everything that happened and claimed that the car had simply disappeared. The men talked about the incident for several hours. When they reached the city, they contacted the police. However, the police couldn't help them in any way. 
Apart from their words, there was no confirmation of the existence of the car. The case was discussed for a while in local newspapers, and then was forgotten. The Gadianton Canyon Incident This incident occurred in May of 1972 in southeastern Utah near the Modena Railroad Crossing on the edge of the Escalante Desert. Jenna North was driving her father's 1971 Chevrolet Nova. Her friend, Carol Abbott, was in the passenger seat. In the back seat, there were two other girls, Lisa Rockford and Bethany Gordon. It was after 10 p.m. when the girls crossed the Utah-Nevada state line. They wanted to get back to campus before their housekeeper, Mrs. Mortensen, locked the dorm doors. This stretch of Highway 56 in Utah is pretty deserted. There's nothing there but sand and a few plants. The girls were very happy when they finally noticed the Union Pacific Railroad crossing in Modena. But right behind the railing, Jenna noticed two highways. One went into the desert, and the other to Gadianton Canyon. The girls decided to take the road to the canyon. They thought it would be a shortcut to campus. The other girls were chatting with each other when Jenna noticed that they were no longer driving on asphalt, but on white cement. Watch out, suddenly shouted one of the girls. The road ended abruptly at a high rock wall. It was a dead end. They had to go back the same way they came here. And while Jenna's friends were complaining that now they would have to sleep in the car, Jenna saw that the landscape had changed dramatically. They weren't in the desert anymore. Instead, the canyon turned into an open area with wheat fields, pine thickets, and a small lake ahead. A full moon was shining in the sky, which was strange because it shouldn't have been there that night. The girls had no idea where they were, so they just drove to the light ahead. It was some building that they thought was a diner or restaurant. The girls saw a bright neon sign, but none of them could read what was written on it. These symbols were unlike any language they knew. Suddenly, several people came out of the building. They seemed shocked and frightened by Jenna's Chevrolet. They waved their hands and shouted something, but the girls didn't understand them. Lisa decided to ask the men for directions. She stuck her head out of the window and immediately let out a terrifying scream. Get out of here, she shouted to Jenna. The Chevrolet sped away from the building. Bright headlights illuminated their car from behind. They were being chased by a few vehicles. These vehicles were egg-shaped, had three wheels, and made a buzzing sound. The road ahead led back to the canyon. Jenna didn't have time to slow down and crashed right into it. The vehicles had disappeared together with an unfamiliar landscape. The girls were back in the desert again. Fortunately, none of them were hurt, physically. But Lisa was in a state of shock. She was saying again and again, they weren't human. The girls had to help her walk. An hour later, they were able to stop a Utah Highway Patrol car. They told the police their story. The details of the report compiled by the police officer were complicated and confusing. During the investigation, the police couldn't figure out from the tire tracks exactly where the car went astray. The tracks ended very abruptly, as if the Chevrolet had suddenly disappeared. The police couldn't explain how the car could have driven two miles without leaving any traces, especially on such solid ground. There are still disputes about this story, but in the end, all versions and explanations of what happened are just guesses. Perhaps we'll never find out the truth. These were the urban legends about interdimensional traveling. Of course, there's no proof that any of these stories are real. Often the truth turns out to be very mundane. For example, the famous man from Taured, who people also called a guest from another reality, turned out to be a simple fraudster named John Allen Kuchar Zegrus. But even so, these stories are still very interesting. One of the most unexplored and mysterious places on Earth is located in plain sight. It's one of the most majestic monuments of humankind. The wonder of the ancient world hides a secret that scientists and archaeologists still can't solve. This is the Great Sphinx of Giza in Egypt. The huge sculpture of a lion with a human head was carved out of rock about four and a half thousand years ago. Scientists still don't know the exact date of its creation and are also unaware of who built it and what for. 
There are many assumptions and theories, but none of them has been confirmed. Most people have seen this majestic sculpture either in photographs or in reality, but almost no one knows what's hidden underneath it. The statue of the Sphinx was carved from a single piece of limestone. It was painted. The remains of color pigment on the surface prove this. In the distant past, the Sphinx looked much brighter and more colorful than what we see now. But even after thousands of years, its greatness hasn't diminished. And by the way, Sphinx is not the real name. It was invented by the Greeks about a hundred years or more after its creation. Initially, the Egyptians called the statue hor em -Akit. There are many legends and theories saying the Sphinx is there for a reason. It's like a watchdog that guards the tomb of the pharaoh and the secrets of ancient Egypt. These legends become more plausible when archaeologists discovered hidden entrances at the feet of the Sphinx. They believe that these secret passages are the beginning of the tunnels leading to the halls with treasures. You can find a lot of stories on the internet that claim the Sphinx hides the Hall of Records, a repository filled with ancient and secret knowledge. One of the main artifacts of this repository is supposed to be the records of the ancient mythical state of Atlantis. According to legends, the entire library from this city was moved under the Sphinx. The entrance to this library must be located next to the Sphinx's right paw. Many archaeologists tried to find this entrance, but came away empty-handed. Also, there are many images with detailed diagrams of the underground city that consists of a network of tunnels and chambers under the Sphinx. Someone says there are structures as tall as 12-story buildings hiding underground, but there's no evidence of this. Archaeologists, even after millennia, continue to explore the mysterious sculpture. At the same time, many Egyptians don't want to learn more about the Sphinx. They're terrified of awakening something supernatural. In 1998, scientists discovered tunnels leading to empty caves under the Sphinx. They found evidence of earlier excavations there. It's quite possible that someone managed to find the treasures and take them away. Some people believe Egyptians found some kind of artifact under the Sphinx that has the power of unknown advanced technologies. The artifact is so powerful that it can change the course of history. Of course, most theories are just fairy tales of conspiracy fans, but it's a confirmed fact that the Sphinx hides a system of caves and rooms. There are so many rumors surrounding the Sphinx that it's impossible to understand what's true and what's false. In any case, it's difficult and dangerous to study the sculpture because active excavations can destroy it. And then the entrance to the underground rooms can get blocked by rocks and lost forever. Also, further exploration requires a lot of money, and financing is not always easy to find. But the main reason? It's too risky. There's no guarantee that people will be able to get out of the underground labyrinths. For these reasons, scientists and archaeologists have been exploring this majestic structure for so long. Another famous architectural monument with a secret is Mount Rushmore in South Dakota. Everyone admires the images of the U.S. president's faces carved into the rock, but few people know that there's a secret room hidden behind the head of Abraham Lincoln. The architect of Mount Rushmore wanted to carve slabs on the rock with the record of the main stages of the country's history. But his plan was too complicated to carry out. Then he was offered to implement it on a much smaller scale, to build a secret room inside the mountain. The idea was to save this knowledge so that future generations will always remember the history of their country. Unfortunately, the architect didn't have time to finish his work. The construction stopped for several decades. But in the late 90s, the project was resumed. Porcelain enamel panels depicting the history of the U.S. were placed in the room. It's possible that these plates will be stored there forever. But people can't see them, at least for now. The room is inaccessible to tourists as it's too difficult to get inside. Another secret room is located in the Empire State Building. 
More precisely, it's not even a room, but a place where you can take cool photos. Almost all tourists gather on the observation deck of the 86th floor to enjoy a stunning view of Manhattan. But there's another deck with panoramic windows on the 102nd floor. There are way fewer people there because almost no one knows about that place. Fortunately, access to this deck is open to everyone. You probably won't have to wait in line for a long time to take a photo. You'll feel special because you're in such a secret place where there are almost no people. But the coolest place is even higher, on the 103rd floor. This is a spacious observation deck where celebrities get their photographs taken. It's not a public place, but if you know the right people, you can get there. There are almost no security measures on the site. Only a low ledge between you and an abyss. That's why crowds of people are forbidden from coming here. It's not so easy to get there. And you're unlikely to succeed without a guide. First, you need to choose the right elevator that will take you there. Then you'll go through several engineering rooms filled with pipes, electrical panels, and other technical stuff. The final part of your way is a set of stairs inside a tiny corridor. And here you are, at the top of New York. Now we're in Paris. <laughs> See the Eiffel Tower? Inside it, there are restaurants and observation decks. But if you try hard, you can find a secret apartment. Now it's a museum, but it was built so that people could live in it. The architect of the tower, Gustav Eiffel, created this apartment in 1889 for himself. It's almost at the very top of the Eiffel Tower. Imagine what a beautiful view he observed every day. He was the first and only tenant. No one else could gain access to this place. When the architect passed away, the apartment remained empty for a long time. Only recently, they restored it and turned it into a museum. Inside, the epoch of the last century is recreated. They even put wax figures of Gustav Eiffel, his daughter, and the American inventor Thomas Edison inside the room. This place is filled with an endless stream of passengers, office workers running late, visitors from other cities, noise, and train whistles. At Grand Central Station in New York, among all these sounds, you can hear the sound of a ball hitting a racket, if you're in the right place. A real tennis court is hidden inside New York Central Station. It belongs to a tennis club that arranges corporate games for employees of many companies. The club was opened in the 60s. Now we're moving to London, Charing Cross Road. It isn't easy to find one secret place here. To do this, you need to look carefully at your feet. Do you see these sewer grates in the asphalt? Inside them, you can notice two signs with the name Little Compton Street. Yeah, there's another street right below you. It disappeared from all maps at the end of the 19th century. Charing Cross Road was built over it. The identification signs that you see are part of old engineering tunnels. There's another interesting place in London. It's located in the southeast corner of Trafalgar Square. At first glance, it looks like a thick lamppost, but there are too many tourists walking around. You come closer and realize that one person can easily fit inside the post. The lamppost belongs not to an electrician, but to a police officer. Yeah, this is the smallest police station in the world. It was built in the 1930s and used as a watch post. Officers had to sit there one by one and watch Trafalgar Square that always attracted a lot of pickpockets and all kinds of other criminals. 